Good morning, and thank you very much for coming along to this talk. As Pavel said, I'm Leonie Watson. I'm an accessibility engineer with the Pasiello Group based in the United States, um, accessibility lead for the UK government. And amongst other things, I work with the W3C on HTML, SVG, and ARIA. And that's one of the things I'd like to talk about today, accessible, rich internet applications, as well as accessibility APIs, accessibility mechanics, and how we can use those things to create custom interfaces that are more usable and accessible to uh, more people. Page down, slide two from the top slide, ARIA accessibility. Now what you can hear there is my screen reader. That's the piece of software that I use to it access my computer and the internet because I can't see the screen. Uh, it goes kind of fast. If you can keep up, good luck. But don't worry, it's not necessary for the talk. What I would like to do, though, is take you back in time, maybe 15 years or so, to uh, show you the way that a screen reader used to interact with content on the web. Page down. From the top. From the top. Lady Watson on technology, food and life in the digital age. Tink.uk. Skip the search. Skip the navigation. Tink accessibility support for CSS generated content posted and code things on March 29, 2015. The CSS before slash after pseudo selectors can be used to insert content into a page. In some situations, this technique is a useful thing to do. But how do browsers and screen readers handle the generated content? Using schema.org with microdata posted and code things on February 25, 2015. Search engines have ways of extracting meaning from content, but they are prone to error because information on the web can be presented in so many different ways. Marking up information so it's easier for search engines to index is a good thing to do. And thanks to the vocabularies available from schema.org, it's also very accessible. Timeout notifications posted and code things on December 29, 2014 when the web application has a session timeout. It's a good idea to warn users about the impending timeout and give them the opportunity to do something about it. It's therefore important to make sure that all so if you're still awake out there, you'll understand what a boring and tedious process it used to be if you had to use a screen reader to access content on the web. And in fact, you'll still hear people say today that it takes a blind person using a screen reader longer than their sighted counterparts to interact with web content. That's really no longer the case, and we're going to see why over the next few slides. Page down, accessibility API slide. Something changed in the mid-1990s, and that was that platform accessibility APIs were introduced. They were a way for assistive technologies like screen readers, speech recognition tools, screen magnifiers, to interrogate information at the operating system level to find out what components were in the interface, menus, icons, graphics, checkboxes, any kind of control or content. And what happened over the years after that was those APIs were extended in their capability so that screen readers and assistive technologies could use them to access not only information in the operating system, but also information from application interfaces and, most recently, uh, browser interfaces. Going back about 10 years or so, that really started to kick in and make a difference. Page down, accessibility stack slide. So what happens is that an assistive technology can use the accessibility API down, to query accessibility. things at the operating system level, in the application, or in rendered content. And the trick to the whole thing is that if an assistive technology comes across, say, a checkbox in the operating system or an application like an email client or a browser or actually in web content, the information that it receives is exactly the same. It treats the thing in exactly the same way. So in theory, there should be real consistency of experience all the way through the different layers of the stack. Page down, down three slide. Slide five. So how do the mechanics of all this work? You'll know that when we load content into a browser, load code into a browser, that the browser will create the document object model, the DOM tree. It's a hierarchical structure of information that we can interact with and manipulate using scripting. Page down, but what you might not know is that, Page up, down, slide. Page down, accessibility. that slide the browser six. also creates an accessibility tree. It takes a bunch of information from the DOM and creates a similar hierarchical model. But this time, the information is there specifically to be used by screen readers and other assistive technologies. And there's a whole load of different types of information available to the assistive technologies from the accessibility tree. Page down, roll slide. One of the things that's available is the role of an element or a piece of content in the page. All HTML elements have implicit roles. By implicit, we mean that when you use something like a paragraph, or in the case of the code on screen, uh, an input with a type of checkbox, 
the browser implicitly knows what its role is, what its purpose is. In this case, that it's a checkbox, therefore it's an interactive control that you can do things with. Uh, as I said, pretty much all HTML elements have implicit roles, so as long as you're using good quality semantic HTML code, the browser is going to pick up and identify what code you've provided and make that information available in the accessibility tree so people like me using a screen reader know what we're dealing with when we look at the content on the page. Page down, state slide. Uh, state is the other type of information that's available in the accessibility tree. Uh, in this case, page down, state. we've put the checked attribute on the input element, and that tells the browser that the checkbox is checked. Again, the information is made available in the accessibility tree. So if I were to look at this checkbox with my screen reader, it would tell me that it was A, a checkbox, and B, in a checked state. And the same goes for all kinds of other different state on the web, and we'll see a couple of examples as we go through. Page down, property slide. Slide nine. Uh, the other thing that's available in the accessibility tree is a whole range of properties about different elements. Uh, there are lots of them, but the most common that you'll come across is an element's accessible name. Like the names we use for each other to tell one another apart in conversation, the accessible name of an element is how you tell it apart from any other element of the same type on the same page. page down, property slide. In this case, we've got a label of tequila for the checkbox, and we've tied it to the input using the for and ID attribute pairing. And that hooks the string tequila to the input box and gives it a, its accessible name. So if someone using a speech recognition tool wanted to use this checkbox, they could call it by name. They could say check or uncheck tequila checkbox. Uh, and that's how the browser and the assistive technology would know which piece of content was supposed to be targeted. Page down, slide 10, semantic navigation. So what difference did all this make to the experience for screen reader users? Well, the first thing it enabled was semantic navigation. In all screen readers now, it's possible to navigate through content by element, like this. Page down, sync heading level one. Accessibility support for CSS generated content heading level two link visited. Using schema.org with microdata heading level two link visited. Accessible timeout notifications heading level two link visited. So that was just using a shortcut key to move from one heading to the next. And how much quicker was that than the first example? How much more efficient for getting to the piece of content you're probably interested in? If you were listening and uh, keeping up clearly, you'll have noticed that the heading levels were told to the user. Uh, heading hierarchy, heading structure is really important to someone who can't see the page. Uh, it helps someone like me understand uh, the relative importance of different sections of information on the page. The screen reader also mentioned that the headings were links, and in some cases told me something about the state, that some of the links were visited. So a lot more semantic information became available to screen reader users, making the experience very, very different. Page down, slide 11, landmark. Something else came along with uh, ARIA and uh, later HTML5. In HTML5 now, if you use any of the sectioning elements like header, footer, nav, article, aside, or main, a whole bunch more information gets made available to screen readers. Page down, banner, main region, accessibility support for CSS generated content article, using schema.org with microdata article, accessible timeout notifications article, navigation region, complementary information, search region, navigation region, content information. So just using those HTML elements uh, with a little bit of extra help to tie in the blog post title to the article element. And again, using a screen reader shortcut key. You've got a really good way of not only navigating to different chunks of content on the page, but also being told what those chunks of content contain. And so with this capability, screen reader users for the first time came as close as we're likely to get for the foreseeable future to doing what sighted people do, and that's taking the whole page in at a kind of quick glance. We can suddenly get a holistic understanding of all the sections of content on a page pretty quickly, uh, and that's made a remarkable difference to the way we interact with content. Page down, JavaScript slide, slide 12. So we've got all these different bits and pieces in the toolkit. We've got platform accessibility APIs, we've got the accessibility tree in the browser, assistive technologies that can make use of them. But what do we do with that as developers? Unfortunately, we can't interact with the accessibility APIs or the accessibility tree using JavaScript. That just isn't possible yet, although we hope it may well be sometime in the future. 
Page down, Aria slide. What we can slide do 13. is use Aria, as I said, accessible, rich internet applications. It's a specification from the W3C, currently in version one, although we're already working on 1.1 and looking ahead to version two. And it's a set of attributes that you can apply to HTML in the first instance that allow you to manipulate or change or override the information that's available in the browser's accessibility tree. It has to be done with a certain amount of caution, but you can make quite a big difference to the experience for screen reader users, especially uh, if you use ARIA. Page down, using ARIA with Slide so 14. Just want to take a quick look at a pretty simple example that ties a lot of these things together, throws in some CSS and some scripting to make a custom element uh, much more accessible to screen reader users. Page down, skeleton HTML slide. So we'll start off with some skeleton HTML, just some very basic HTML. Uh, a span, which we're going to use to create the control of a disclosure widget, and a div to contain the content. It's pretty simple stuff. I mentioned uh, in an earlier slide that HTML, elements, HTML elements all have implicit roles. Div and span do, but they're what we call semantically neutral. Nothing about them is really uh, exposed to screen readers and assistive technologies. So a screen reader would really just treat this code as though it contained plain text and nothing more. If we were throwing some CSS and scripting at it, we'd come up with a fully-fledged disclosure widget, which for a mouse user would work something like this. So it's really easy to see when the mouse hovers over the control. You can use the control, the disclosure widget works, everything's pretty good. If you use a keyboard, this is what happens when you try the same thing. Absolutely nothing at all. A span is not an interactive element. So if you're a keyboard user and you use the tab key to move through focusable elements on the page, you can't get to this control. And that means if you can't get to it, you can't use it. So everything pretty much stops there. If you use a screen reader, you can focus on it, but this is what happens. That's it. As I said, it just treats it like plain text. Screen reader just announces the label for the button, but nothing else. Uh, I don't know that it's a button, therefore I don't know that you can interact with it, therefore I don't know that there's any functionality, and would probably just carry on without ever realizing there was more content that I could discover. So what can we do about that? Slide. Slide. We can use some ARIA, starting with the role attribute and giving it a value of button and putting that on the span control. What the role attribute does is let you explicitly apply a role to an HTML element, overriding the implicit role that's already there. This is one of the things you want to do slightly cautiously. It's OK to do it with a span, but it would make no sense, for example, to try and turn a heading into a button. That would cause all sorts of trouble. But in this case, what we're doing in the accessibility tree is saying to a screen reader, ignore the fact that this is a span, treat it like a button. There are a couple of things to be aware of, though. All this is doing is telling assistive technologies to treat this like a button. It's not adding in any functionality. It's not going to give it the behavior of a button. And it's not going to change anything in the DOM either. This is an accessibility-only difference that we're making here. Page down. Add to index slide. Uh, we're going to add keyboard focusability by putting tab index on the button. Page down. Add to index. And we're going to use a value of zero, because that will place the control in the tab order of the page based on the element's location within the DOM. So it's the most natural way to add an element into the keyboard focus order. And tab index uh, has been around a long time. Its capabilities were originally extended in ARIA 1.0, but those changes have also been wrapped into the HTML5 specification now. Page down. Add focus slide. What we're going to do now, we can focus on the button with a keyboard, is make sure that someone who's sighted and using a keyboard uh, knows when focus is on the button. And to do that, we're just going to duplicate the CSS that we were already using for the hover styles so that they work on focus as well as on hover. Really simple, just duplicate exactly the same visual effect. But it's worth knowing that for keyboard users, knowing where your focus is currently positioned on the page is even more important. If you're a mouse user, you can just point, click on the thing you want to use. If you're a keyboard user, if you don't know what you're focused on, uh, anything could happen when you hit the Enter key to activate it. So it's always good to give people that signpost. Page down. Add listener slide. Slide 21. Uh, we're then going to add in some keyboard functionality. Um, we're already listening for mouse events, but we now need to start listening for keyboard events too. We're going to use the key down listener rather than key press because we need to know specifically which keys are used to activate the button. 
if you use the HTML button element, then the browser will naturally provide keyboard support for either the space or the enter key. That's the expected behavior. So we need to mimic that. Now we're creating a custom control. Um, by using key down, we can listen out and uh, grab the key codes that are returned. Page down, add keyboard interaction slides. And from there, we can say that if either of those keys are pressed, then uh, we need to go ahead and execute the rest of the function that we've got in mind for the widget. And if any other keys are pressed, we can just let them go on through and do whatever their default purpose is supposed to be. Page down, add ARIA expanded slides. Slide. Then we're going to come back to some more ARIA, and we're going to use the ARIA-expanded attribute to provide some information about the state of the widget. Page down, add ARIA uh, it goes on the button control, and initially we're going to set it to false on the assumption that the disclosure widget will be closed when someone comes to it. It'll get toggled to true when the button is activated. And as soon as that happens, the information that's available through the accessibility tree will change. So a screen reader coming to this control will now be told whether the widget is open or expanded uh, or closed or collapsed. So we're starting to build up the information that's apparent visually, but in such a way that someone who can't see the page is able to understand it. Page down, add state visual slide, slide 24. Uh, we're going to add in some visual effects to complement the expanded state. We're going to use uh, attribute selectors uh, for no particular accessibility reason, but it saves using a class in the HTML. And I personally prefer clean HTML, so if I can do away with some classes along the way, so much the better. But it also has a, a slightly more uh, real effect, and that's that it harmonizes the state of the visuals with the state of the content. And, and that thing keeps uh, you know, a relationship working very smoothly together. So as the state of the RE expanded attribute is changed, we're going to toggle between two different icons uh, just displayed on the button to uh, give extra visual reassurance about the state of the widget. Page down, add ARIA control slide, slide 20. We're then going to use ARIA-controls to create a relationship between the button and the content that it's controlling. Page down, add ARIA. And we stick the attribute on the button, and we give it the idref of the div containing the content as its value. If you're looking at the page, it'll be really obvious when the content's open or closed, displayed or not displayed. But again, if you can't see the screen, just because you've hit the button and you know something has now expanded, it's really not easy to tell what. ARIA controls creates that relationship and tells screen reader users about it. So now when a screen reader user activates the button, they'll be told that content has changed. And in the case of many screen readers, we'll be given a shortcut to move to the content that's changed. Page down, add ARIA hidden slide. We're then going to use ARIA-hidden uh, in a couple of different places. Page down, add ARIA hidden slide. Uh, we're going to use ARIA-hidden to remove the content on the element from the accessibility tree completely. If the content isn't really needed by assistive technologies, there's not much point in it being rendered in the accessibility tree, so we might as well save the browser the job. We're going to use ARIA hidden set to true on the span holding the icon, because there's no real reason why a screen reader user needs to be aware of a purely visual uh, piece of content. We're also going to use it on the div containing the disclosure widget's content. Uh, initially, we're going to set it to true, because as I said before, the widget is going to be closed by default and toggle it to false uh, when the widget is activated. And that'll then put this content back into the accessibility tree as it becomes visually displayed uh, so a screen reader user knows it's there. Page down, add more state visual slide. Sli and then we're going to do the same thing we did with the icon. We're going to tie the ARIA hidden state on the div and the CSS together. So we're providing the display change settings uh, in correspondence with the state of the ARIA hidden attribute, just keeping it all hooked together and working, hopefully pretty well. Page down, add functionality slide. Lastly, we're going to bring it all together with the rest of the scripting in the widget. Um, and we're just going to use the JavaScript to toggle the state of the ARIA expanded and ARIA hidden slides. And in doing that, we just set off that cascade reaction. So the state changes, the information that's available to a screen reader changes, and the styles change, uh, all based off a very simple function. Page down, using a screen, slide 29. So having put all that time and effort into it, uh, this is the difference that it makes to a screen reader user. Page down, the key of button collapsed. The key of button expanded. Use JAWS key plus ALT plus M to move the controlled element. Move the controlled element. It makes me happy, dot, dot, dot. And it certainly does, but not as happy as knowing that we've got pretty much exactly the same widget that we started out with. It looks the same, it behaves the same, but for someone like me, 
uh, it's now much more usable. Well, it is usable, and there's a great deal of information available to me about how the thing works, what it is, what's changing, and that lets me get at the content. But it also brings me on to another Page point. Now, all of this is good for helping people using screen readers. Uh, at the moment, screen readers are really the only assistive technologies with serious ARIA support. Uh, Dragon, the speech recognition tool, does. But helping one group of people is a good place to start. There's a temptation with accessibility to think it has to be perfect. Uh, this is technology. This is people. We don't do perfect. It never happens. So really, please don't go out there and think if you're going to do accessibility, you have to get everything right. Uh, perfect is very much the enemy, enemy of good. People come in all shapes and sizes and different configurations, and thank goodness that we do. And accessibility is very much the same. So just try and fix some things, one thing, two things, another thing tomorrow. And if you can do that, then trust me, you'll be making a difference for somebody out there in your audience. Page down. Oh, like you Slide and 31. really, for me, that's the important thing about accessibility. It's not about legislation or conformance or guidelines. It's not even necessarily about the technology itself. But it is about putting time and effort into the things that we build giving a damn about the things that we build, but most importantly, giving a damn about the people who are going to be using the things that we build. Page down. Slide. Thank Slide you. 32. Mm -hmm. I have, well, two questions, actually. <laughs> First question is that you said that the accessibility tree cannot be modified from the uh, from JavaScript, mm -hmm. but later on in the code example, you actually modify the attributes. So uh, I don't know what, ex what exactly you can modify and what you cannot modify. So in the scripting, what we were doing was changing the ARIA attributes that we put on the HTML. The ARIA then changes the information that's available in the accessibility tree. What I meant was that there are no JavaScript methods or properties or anything you can get at directly within the API or the accessibility tree. You have to go through ARIA to do it. So it's not like uh, you know interacting with the DOM where you can just, just get straight in and manipulate it directly. You have to change the ARIA within the HTML in order to change the accessibility tree. Uh, you've shown how much effort it takes to make a a uh, random HTML element like a behave like a button. Wouldn't you have the same experience if you would just use a native button element in HTML? Uh, yes, and you know, it's always a better option to use native HTML if you can, because the browser does all the hard work for you. So pretty much everything apart from the state uh, attributes that we applied the browser would have done automatically for you. So a, a button element would be keyboard focusable. You'd get the keyboard interaction. All you'd need to do really to top and tail it would be to add in the ARIA expanded, ARIA controls and things like that. Uh, so yeah, it's always easier to do that, but you know, JavaScript frameworks, what can we do? <laughs> There's a lot of stuff out there where we have to start from, from less than ideal basic code. So this is what you need to do if that's the situation you find yourself in. Uh, how can I program more complex interaction? Sorry, how can I program more complex interactions like drag and drop or swiping? Uh, Aria has capability for drag and drop. Um, I'll tweet afterwards. Um, there's a whole bunch of design patterns for Aria for all kinds of widgets, um, sliders, tab sets, uh, dialogues, a whole bunch of different pieces. Uh, I'm not actually sure if there is a drag and drop design pattern in there, but the specification does have a whole bunch of attributes specifically for drag and drop. Um, sliders as well, um, there's, there's a design pattern for in there. So ARIA is really quite capable, um, and it's, as I say, continuing to evolve. We're, we're looking at new features in 1.1, um, and in version 2, actually expanding it into SVG. Um, and also, uh, one of the things under hot discussion at the moment is adding in new roles and features for digital publishing as well. So it's always on the move. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to thank you for the talk first. Thank you. And um, I'm really curious about um, skip to navigation link. Mm. Um, given that we have um, all the new HTML um, tags now and and ARIA roles and everything. How is it? Is it is it still necessary, or is it pretty much you know? Uh, it is at the moment. Um, the HTML5 main element actually gives us our best hope for getting rid of skip links. 
um, if we as developers use the main element, it should be easy for browsers and assistive technologies to build shortcuts in that do the equivalent of a skip link, but just natively within the browser. Uh, the JAWS screen reader on Windows, which is the one you were listening to for the demonstrations, already has that capability. So there's a shortcut in that screen reader uh, for moving straight to the start of the main element if it happens to exist on the page. So if we can encourage the browser vendors to build that kind of functionality in so it's there for everybody, keyboard users, sighted, as well as screen reader users, uh, we'd be well on our way to, to being able to get rid of a skip link. And that, to my way of thinking, would be a really good thing. Thank you. Uh, hi. So how actually we can test uh, our code? So uh, we can catch quite fastly uh, the stuff that might uh, need some improvement about accessibility. Do you have any tips about that? For, for testing? Yeah. No, well, generally for catching up to stuff that is mm -hmm. not accessible for everyone. Uh, there's a really good tool uh, that I use called Tenon, T-E-N-O-N uh, dot I-O is the website, uh, which is a really good accessibility testing tool. Uh, it's not like many other tools in that it doesn't try to test things it really can't, but it's also built for developers, so you can incorporate it into uh, Grunt, Gulp, whatever your, your, your continuous build server processes. So that's a really useful tool to use. Apart from that, I would say uh, get a screen reader or other assistive technology and start to play around with it. Don't necessarily base any decisions on your own experiences because they take a little bit of getting used to, um, but it's a good idea to get a, a feel for it. If you use a Mac, hit Command F5 to turn the integrated screen reader on or off. If you use Windows, go download a copy of a free screen reader called NVDA and just play around and get a sense of it. If you can, find someone, people with different disabilities who use different technologies and ask them to play around with it because then you'll start to get the real usability experience. And, and that, beyond any kind of testing, is really the, uh, you know, the test of the metal of what you're building. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, uh, how bad are fake links uh, with em empty href attribute compared to buttons? Uh, pretty much the same effect as the button when we demoed it right at the beginning. Um, you will hear a piece of plain text, but without the href attribute, uh, a link isn't an interactive element as far as the browser is concerned. So a screen reader user won't tell you that it's a link. It'll just treat it like a piece of, of plain old text on the page. Um, depending on how you've done the scripting to add in the functionality as well, unless you've done something pretty similar to, to what we did with the button there, only you just need to worry about the enter key, not space, um, then you wouldn't be able to interact with it even if you took an educated guess at thinking it was a link. So they're pretty bad, really. So is it, is it, is it better than span uh, with uh, roles or...? Uh, actually, a, a link without an href is pretty much the equivalent of a span. With, with nothing added to it. So in either case, um, you could uh, add a role of link if you wanted to create a link. Um, you'd then need to, as I say, make sure the scripting catered for, for the keyboard support for activating the link with the enter key. Uh, and that would pretty much do the trick. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, so what about an href equals hash, which uh, isn't a common pattern? That would show up as a link because the href is there with a the value, so the browser would then make that an interactive element, so the screen reader would actually tell you that it was a link uh, and could be treated like one, so the keyboard support would kick in. Uh, from a screen reader user's point of view, um, you'd be told that it was the same page link, um, like an anchor link, of course, because of the, of the hash. So you'd be slightly misinformed, um, depending on what the actual purpose of the link was. In your presentation, some elements were uh, accompanied by the sound effect. Uh, does providing sound effects on the website could be helpful for people using uh, screen readers like marking a focus, or it would rather, rather bother you and get in a way of how the screen reader works? Uh, yes, it could. Um, it's actually something uh, you find a lot more on actually mobile devices. Um, both Apple and uh, or iOS and Android, um, as you're moving through a mobile interface, they're really good at providing audio cues to tell you when you've kind of moved focus to a different app icon or something like that. So the model really does work. You'd want to be careful that it was subtle enough. Um, if you listen to content as opposed to look at it, that's the sound that you're most interested in. So if the website were to provide something else to kind of make that easier, uh, it's really important to get the balance 
you know, so the, the, the additional sounds are, are just enough to be usable um, without kind of overwhelming the screen reader itself. But with things like the, you know, the speech APIs and, and web audio APIs that are picking up on browser support now, yep, there's a lot of potential for adding in that kind of um, additional stuff. Uh, we talked earlier about uh, having uh, href with a hash. Is mm -hmm. it any better if you uh, prevent default with JavaScript, or is it as bad? Um, no, what I generally advise is to use a hash, um, make sure the link text is, is reasonably clear, um, and, and, and just sort of take that as an acceptable um, hit if you start putting... From an accessibility point of view, actually, it doesn't make too much difference, but I'm always just a bit loath to use JavaScript to prevent default um, because it all comes unhinged if you drop the JavaScript support, which isn't an accessibility thing, but uh, I still try not to make it too dependent if, if it's avoidable. Can you add an ARIA attribute or anything to make it uh, not be picked up if it's not relevant to uh, screen readers? You mean the whole link? Uh, yeah. Yes, you could put ARIA hidden on it, and that would, would leave it visible on the page, um, but it would take it out of the accessibility tree completely, so for a screen reader user, it, it would cease to exist. So, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yes, okay. Um, there's a hidden attribute in, in HTML. Um, does it work with assistive technology without any additional area hidden? Uh, yes, it does, but support is still a bit more unstable in assistive technologies. Um, but yes, you can use it. it it's, it's getting better, so. It's getting better, so, so in foreseeable future, you don't need both. You just use a HTML hidden attribute, and it works for both visually and for assistive technology. Yes, uh, and I think actually on interactive controls, that's the only place you can use it in HTML, if memory serves. I could be wrong about that. Whereas ARIA hidden, you can use on any element. Um, but don't quote me on that, actually. I would need to check it. But yes, the, 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 the ideal is that ultimately you just use HTML and you don't need the ARIA anymore. I don't see any more questions, so thank you very much cool. for coming. Thanks very much.